Uh, my name is Igor Martinovich, and you're listening to Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Ben, welcome to another fine edition of the Cinematography Podcast. Why, thank you, Ilya. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. How about yourself? I'm doing great, actually. Uh, getting used to this being on video thing. Still, uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. But uh, if you're listening to this and you're wondering what my messy office looks like, head on over to YouTube and uh, watch us on YouTube. I am mystified that people want to watch podcasts. I'm like, how could I walk my dog while I was watching a podcast? You know, I think that it's not really watching the podcast for everyone, but there are people who do a lot of work in front of YouTube and YouTube just sort of auto plays and they mm. listen to <laughs> they listen to podcasts on YouTube at like one and a half times normal speed. So we all sound a little bit chipmunky and we all talk really, really fast like that. But I, I think that there are people out there that that is their workflow. And so now we're embracing it. Now we're giving people uh, multiple ways to interact with us. If you want to interact with us and give the people other way. what they want. That's what we do is we give the people what they want. So enjoy. Enjoy. I hope you're all happy. I, I assure you, though, Ben, before the end of the year, we will improve this. We will have a, a righteous video system. I'm going to make it my mission. I have not gotten into it fully yet. But now that we're doing this, in your future will be something better than your webcam to record or your cell phone. We will figure this out. We will have a better system. And, but wait, uh, Ilya, where on earth could I get better camera equipment? I don't, you know, I don't even I have no idea where one could go to get camera equipment. You could go to Hot Rod Cameras. Hot Rod oh. Cameras is, is you know, sometimes the sponsor of the show, actually the presenting sponsor of the show. And I assure mm. you, Hot Rod Cameras is going to solve this. It has just never been an issue we ever needed solving before the last couple of weeks. So now, oh my God. now, now we're going to do it. Hey, Ben, who is our featured guest today on the show? I'm very excited. We have Igor Martinovich who is uh, the DP of Pigeon Tunnel, the new Errol Morris film, which is currently streaming on Apple TV. It's streaming on there. Errol Morris, uh, one of my heroes, uh, for real. The first interview I ever did, I, the, uh, the first time I ever did anything like journalism was uh, our, fr our mutual friend Janelle Riley at Backstage asked me if I wanted to interview Errol Morris for The Fog of War. And Errol Morris is the best interviewer who ever lived, in my opinion. I, I, I think his... Interview-based documentaries are some of my favorites, and also nobody does it like him. And he innovated so many things, including the now uh, ubiquitous uh, people looking right down the barrel of the camera lens look in documentaries. Uh, the Interatron. Or yes. <laughs> yeah, he called it the Interatron, and now uh, you know you can get the poor man's Interatron, which is called the iDirect. I have one in the room with me that I've used on several shoots that's just like a weird mirror rig that you put on a camera, and you can uh, get the down-the-barrel look while people make eye contact with you during an interview. But anyway, uh, Igor shot several of Errol Morris's films, starting with Wormwood. Back in the day when we interviewed Ellen Curus, she shot the interviews and Igor shot the reenactments. And ever since then, Igor has shot, I believe, every documentary that Errol Morris has done. The newest one is Pigeon Tunnel, which is about John Le Carré. It's a long form interview with John Le Carré. And it's kind of about his life because he was not only a spy novelist, but he was a spy. Mm, it sounds awesome. I, and, I, it, I, and it I'm looks great. For it. There are frames of Igor's work in this that you would just hang on your wall. It's just such a beautiful film. And I love talking to him because he talks through sort of the artistic process of coming up with a look and a style for Errol Morris interviews and Errol Morris reenactments and even kind of gets into the nitty gritty of how long they shoot for, which was a shockingly short interval of time, by the way, for a whole movie. Spoiler alert. It's like four days of interviews and like 10 days, I think, of reenactments. And that's wow. it. And then that's you got really you got your new Errol Morris movie. Yeah. And uh, this stuff is very stylized. Errol Morris has always been kind of anti-cinema verite school of documentary filmmaking. His stuff is, he, he doesn't like even calling them documentaries. He calls them nonfiction films. And he, you know, won, won the Oscar for The Fog of War, the one I interviewed him about. I, I, I take all the credit. It's because of my interview. It's because of er your interview, for sure. Er yeah, Errol Morris. 100%. Errol Morris won the Oscar. Uh, probably my personal favorite of Errol Morris's to this day is Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, 
uh, which was shot by Bob Richardson, who we've had on the podcast, but didn't really get to get too deep into the Errol Morris of it because we were, of course, talking about emancipation at the time. But if we ever get Bob on again, I uh, 1,000 million zillion percent want to ask him a lot of questions about that movie because I think it's just one of the most brilliant films ever made. It's like it's in my Mount Rushmore of movies, like uh, a desert island movie. It's, it's something that I can just watch over and over again. But uh, Pigeon Tunnel is really fantastic it looks amazing and i recommend anyone listening to me go check it out and then listen to our interview with uh, igor for sure and now close focus so Ilya, you had our pitch today for what our close focus should be what what you thinking what you focusing on closely <laughs> uh well as much as i thought that i liked george clooney emma stone ben mm-hmm. affleck tyler perry scarlett johansson uh, I think I like them all even more now. Uh, they are... I don't know, uh, man. George Clooney knows what he did. Go on. <laughs> uh, it turns out during the October 17th SAG-AFTRA meeting, uh, official membership meeting, they all got together and they proposed to Fran Drescher and SAG leadership that they get rid of the cap on the highest grossing, most successful actors in Hollywood for their SAG dues. Right now, those people, it's capped at a million dollars. If you are super wealthy and super successful, you're not paying more than a million dollars to to SAG for your dues. So George Clooney and company decided, hey, well, uh, if we get rid of that, we should be able to raise the income that SAG has coming in by about $50 million a year or about $150 million over the next three years. And they did this specifically to try to help smooth out the strike right now as a way to get more revenue into the coffers of SAG. And also, they also, and I love this, proposed that stop giving A-list, the stars, the big names on a production first crack at residuals and instead giving residuals first to the people at the bottom and let Mm. the people who already have the money uh, wait longer before that those residuals start coming in. And they did this. I mean, is is there really an interval between when people at one side of the call sheet get residuals versus the other? I'm assuming there must be. Otherwise, they wouldn't they wouldn't suggest to this because they're not they're not suggesting they get less residuals just that they get them later. It's what it sounds like. It sounds like they would defer that so people who are lower on the call sheet yeah, would yeah, they would be the last to collect, hmm. not the first. So my guess is is that probably whatever money that would go out then, it would go out to a, a far larger number of people potentially. And they would maybe fully collect the residuals before they ever before the people at the top of the call sheet ever saw a cent. So what would you call to, that? Would you call that unfavored nations? I would say it's really progressive. Like, I mean, yeah. we have like a very regressive tax I mean, system. I was yeah. making a joke, but yeah, you're, you're, yes. right. <laughs> you're okay. So and it just flew right past me because I was like, I was so in the sort of like collective spirit of this. It, it feels very uh, socialist. It feels mm. like, you know, here it's a society of people who all got together, this union, this club. And they said, you know what? Let's make the people who earn the most pay the most and let's give more to the people who earn less. I mean, it's like, it's, it sounds... It, it, I, I mean, I don't know. It's it sounds very. It's, uh, I, I would call it a reverse Ponzi scheme in a way, you know, where and and I mean that in a good way, you know, of course. where where it's like the people at the bottom of the pyramid are actually getting a, a little bit more of their share, and it's because they're the ones who need it the most, you know. I, I mean, obviously, you know, Emma Stone, George Clooney, et cetera, et cetera. They don't. They're they're doing just fine. So I I mean, like I myself, stupid old dumb old me. I'm involved in three projects that are currently waiting on SAG interim agreements, and we can't move forward towards getting our projects made. Uh, well, one of them actually got the interim agreement, but we can't move forward with the other ones until we get, you know, an interim agreement or, or the strike ends. Now, like, you know, I'm just some doofus here, but like every major actor, director, writer that you know of have are, are they're sitting on projects. There's so many that are ready to go right now that can't move an inch until the strike is over. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's by, not... by the way, that's not an indictment of of SAG after at all. By the way, I'm I'm with, I'm with SAG after on this. No, I, I don't think anyone thinks that uh, that that you're against that. I, I think that really what everyone wants though is a resolution. Everyone wants to get to that to that resolution, and we're currently in this stagnation that's been going on for months, and. 
at the pace it's going right now, it sounds like it's, you know, all the reports are, they're still pretty far apart. So anything that can happen on either side to help sort of like, you know, nudge everything f- further, I'm all for it. I think that the sooner this happens, the sooner people can get back to work, the sooner plans can start being made. Uh, I've heard from a couple of clients that, you know, people are planning on January, January getting back to work. That's still several months away. And well, I mean, when you think about it, though, especially with the television industry, mm. they just got their writers back. Mm-hmm. And so they don't most of them shot out whatever scripts they had, you know, back in the spring. And so for television, they need to write new scripts, which is what they're doing right now. And it's movies mostly that are held up by the SAG after strike. But if the SAG after strike ended tomorrow, here we are. If you another were like, 60 days till the end of the year. Yeah, exactly. Like if you were like, uh, if the strike ended tomorrow, phasers on kill, you're all, you're a month away from December. Uh, December, and everyone de- knows that the whole town shuts down in December. December is the usually town, traditionally basically the, the, the yeah. town shuts down ar- around the week of Thanksgiving. If you're not moving by Thanksgiving, you can forget about it until January. So if I were the AMPTP, I don't know. Uh, well, you know, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of other just having the strike over though, having it over long before the end of the year gives people the. Uh, ability to plan the next couple of months. You know, maybe they, if they know that work is returning in January, that means they may be able to get that vacation in December. Some, like right now, they're probably like hanging on, like, boy, will I get a call? Will I get a couple of days on something, on like, well, you know, a concert and the film big, or the something? The big thing too, and, and like I'm hung up, uh, a project I have is hung up in this limbo right now, which is you can't even during the SAG strike go to an actor and ask them if they can, it, you can't even ask them to read a script. If they're your best friend, they would be violating SAG rules to read the script. So you can't attach actors and you can't often get your projects financed without actors attached. And so it kind of prevents even money being moved into getting getting something greenlit or moving at all, even if you didn't intend to shoot until March. It's the, the same is true on the technical side of the, the industry, not because of the strike restrictions, but because this is going on, Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who spend money the last week of the year. The last week of the year is actually sometimes a really nice, nice little blip for, for hot rod because people go, you know, I made this much money. I need to spend this much money. I need to spend a certain amount or otherwise I lose it in taxes. They're taking full advantage of the 179 write off deduction, which is a, which is a a wonderful uh, tax discount that if anyone out there does have money to spend and they don't know about 179, they really should look into that because it can lower your tax burden. And uh, but just as an aside, if if we don't have people who know that they're going to be returning to work in January, I have a feeling they're going to try to hold on to every single dollar that they possibly can. Oh, for sure. And the same thing is true with other support industries, restaurants and caterers and Mm. people who they need to plan out the next few months. And if they can start booking jobs and and making plans, they know then, hey, do I need to invest in something? Do I need to hire more people? And for many of the rental houses, which have really been hit hard, devastated by the last six months, uh, they need to plan out gear. Sometimes uh, they, they've they been holding off on making gear purchases and they're going to need gear when shows come back because everyone's anticipating a bump. Who knows how big that bump will be? But if they can't make plans for that, it puts everyone sort of behind the eight ball and puts us in a worse spot next year when it comes time to actually, you know, mm-hmm. get up and going again. Anyway, Ben, I I think that we should probably get to our interview. We, we I think we've yacked about this plenty, and it's something that I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about more in the coming weeks. And so why don't we get to the interview? Here we go. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm here with Igor Martinovich, the cinematographer for uh, one of my heroes, Errol Morris's new film, The Pigeon Tunnel, uh, which is currently streaming on Apple TV. I have watched it twice. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Igor. Uh, I just love your work. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. So let's jump in and first talk about The Pigeon Tunnel. The Pigeon Tunnel is uh, a long form interview with the man known to the world as John Le Carré. And it's sort of a, a history of his life. And Errol Morris's style is kind of evolved. He doesn't just do the Interotron shot anymore. He, he he has a lot of different interview shots, but there's something completely unique to Errol Morris's style. And I feel like, you know, you've been working with him, I think, since Wormwood. Your work is kind of deeply infused with his. Can you kind of talk about what led you to work with, uh, with Errol Morris and kind of what your working relationship is like with him? 
Yeah, we have done like so many different things. Uh, we've done a lot of commercials together. We, uh, we've done four feature land, uh, I mean, three feature land documentaries and one TV series that is a five part TV series. It is uh, it is a unique relationship because Errol is uh, known for his interview style and uh, and his interview techniques. But I, I, I think not much attention is paid to his uh, visual style, which is incredible and unique. And he's really, I think, changing the medium, documentary medium, with each film pushing it a little bit further, challenging the norms, uh, how things are done. So the um, Pigeon Tunnel is the story about uh, John Le Carré, uh, famous spy writer, as well as a spy novel uh, writer, as well as an uh, actual spy in real life who worked for British intelligence for many, many years. So uh, the story is about someone that, that uh, embodies different personalities in order to achieve his goals and work as a spy. He had to lie in order to to get certain information. So he would present himself with different personalities. So the idea for visuals for this documentary was to, to create images that contain uh, multiple views of the same person. So what we did uh, was we shot interviews with him, with uh, David, uh, John Le Carré, uh, using uh, multiple mirrors. So we used four cameras to shoot interviews, but then we had up to 12 mirrors in the shot that reflect different parts of the room and different uh, reflections of him. So the idea of multiple personalities uh, was transferred into multiple uh, multiplying images. So that, that was the core of it, which we uh, also were, uh, used in, uh, in certain B-roll shots with him, where we, we had like... Uh, uh, mirrors in the woods where he would yeah, walk I, between those mirrors or it's a gorgeous uh, like i would just so frame that so and hang that on my wall it's it's such a beautiful shot of yeah I, and it, and it, i think it's in the trailer and it's in like on the first 10 minutes of the movie i guess but yeah it's just it's it's haunting and interesting and I, and as i was watching it i feel like what was cool about that kind of stuff is as a viewer i'm trying to decode what what is Errol Morris and what are you saying about this guy by making that the B-roll shot? Because, you know, the the normal way to approach, you know, reenactment, as Errol Morris does in a lot of his documentaries, is just artistic recreations. And he has his way of, you know, filming kind of interesting angles and stuff like that. But like in, with that kind of stuff, I was really wondering what you guys were going for. It was really, uh, it, it was art. It was intriguing. You know, it's 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 amazing to see it. Yeah, I mean, for me, that, that's the most important element of cinematography is uh, creating a concept. What is the concept that can tell a parallel story to the story we are telling, you know, a parallel story that is visual story uh, to, to the story we are telling and uh, how uh, how can this be represented to add another layer to the story that uh, is not necessarily right away. I actually haven't uh, seen anyone comment on that, like and, and none of the critics actually noticed that. Really? Um, in the in their reviews, but uh, it, yeah, but it's 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 kind of a, a beautiful thing that you add to the film, and then the people will notice it subconsciously. They don't notice consciously. Well, and the way it hit me was this is about a guy who was a spy who also wrote spy novels. So what I'm seeing here is again when I when I saw that kind of imagery, you know, also there was that image that I loved that was sort of like a living room house with eggs all over the floor and the light was like subtly shifting. And it was just like, in both cases, I would say kind of gorgeous surrealism that yes. I, again, like I assumed kind of must dovetail at least psychologically in, you know, cause obviously he doesn't tell a story where the mirrors in the woods thing makes any literal sense. That's not the point. It was to evoke that feeling and it was so intriguing and interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea was about, uh, the idea of multiplying was present in many uh, aspects of the film. I mean, uh, the, the graphics and uh, multiple images within the frame, the music repeats itself. So multiplication is something that uh, there was a, a part of, of, of our approach, definitely. And also, I mean, what we we did the recreations and in recreations, a lot of the story that is actually John Lecrae's upbringing and his uh, troubled uh, childhood with the father who was deceiving and lying and constantly uh, being arrested and in prison and so on. So the brokenness of his childhood, of his upbringing was represented in the images as well. We had purposely created images that were imbalanced. They were not in perfect symmetry. So a lot of those images are kind of off-framed or uh, a negative frame or, you know, in a way that uh, kind of represent unstable condition he was, he, was, uh, uh, he was growing up in. Yeah, yeah. 
could you talk about sort of the creative process of creating the reenactments that you guys do? I, I mean, I assume Errol Morris does the interviews first and then cuts it and figures out where he wants to do that stuff. But there's such a specific style that he goes for. And I think, I mean, like you could go back to Thin Blue Line and the way that he, he shot uh, the reenactments in, in that movie. The one that is probably closest to my heart was uh, Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, which was shot by uh, Robert Richardson. But there's like something really specific in his style in regards to how that stuff is shot. Does he come to you with storyboards? Does he come to you with like a shot list and you kind of help him kind of create these, uh, I'm just going to say kind of eccentric. They're not always oblique angles, but, the, but, <laughs> but it's, if you were going to go shoot an episodic TV show about this guy, this, these are not the angles that would probably go to network TV. They're more creative and inventive and interesting. For sure. I mean, uh, going back to Tim Line, I think he single-handedly changed how he, meaning Aero Mori, single-handedly changed how uh, documentaries are done. Agreed. Uh, because uh, it was right uh, in the right in the middle of the cinema verite style, and then he came in and he he just changed everything. And interestingly enough, when I was doing Men on Wire, we watched Tim Blue Line uh, several times to to actually try to to see how things were done. And some of those uh, shots in Men on Wire were inspired by the by Errol's work, and it was actually that makes amazing total sense. to actually come back and and start working. You know, so it's like a full circle, start working with Errol Morris. And yes, I mean, uh, the, we first do interviews. This time we did interviews. It was, uh, I think, four days of interviewing in, in London. We did also shoot some visuals with uh, um, with David, uh, John Le Carre. There is a cut of the interviews. And uh, sometimes there are storyboards, but storyboards we don't look at. The storyboards mm. are there in the edit to to show the context of the images as well as to uh, usually fundraise uh, <laughs> a little bit more money so we can actually do this. And yeah. uh, so, but once we start working, we don't look at storyboards. We don't look, uh, we, we know the, obviously there is a script and we know the scenes, but it is very, very open-minded process where we just like shoot images that, that speak to us. Usually we shoot two takes, three takes max, and we move on. Multiple cameras, yes. And uh, a lot of it is kind of improvisational style. It's almost like a jazz, you know, like where, you know, I would get an idea. Yeah, I would get an idea. And we, I mean, obviously, it's, uh, we go, we do, do location scout, we prepare, we know what we are doing. It's not like a, a random shooting. We know that what the scenes are going to be. But then the shots, a lot of times it's, it's on the spot. It's like, uh, you know, it either speaks, you know, like if I set up the shot and, uh, uh, Errol would look at it and he'd be like, yeah, I don't think so. Let's do something else. And then he would come up with a with shot or the other way around, which is, it's actually a really beautiful relationship where we challenge each other constantly. I learned a lot because Errol is really not afraid to experiment, to play with the shots. Definitely not conservative. He likes unusual frames. He likes frames that are, that are frames with tension. Yeah, it's 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 a beautiful, beautiful co collaboration. I have to say. Well, and, and as a humongous uh, you know fan of his work, I've been kind of following the trajectory of his style. Like he did a movie, I think it was maybe ten or twelve years ago, called The B Side, where he threw out the whole yes. Interotron inter thing and just did it did it all completely differently. But then he kind of sort of returned to form with Wormwood. And if uh, we we interviewed Ellen Curis years ago around the time of Wormwood, because you're both credited on that one, and I had assumed because she was such a well-known narrative DP that she'd done the reenactments and you had done the interviews. And she's like, no, no, no. She, she did the interviews and then had to go off and work on something. And you took over for uh, the reenactments, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and yes. I mean, the, the work is just, uh, I, I want you to take that as the highest freaking compliment because I worship Ellen Curis and I think her work is amazing that I mistook her work for or your work for her work. Like I, I, I thought like, clearly that's, that's her stuff, but it was interesting with Wormwood that like, it was the first time I'd ever seen him work with multiple cameras. And now that's seems to be like, he's finding multiple camera angles within the interviews. So how do you go about when you're doing one of these interviews where you have multiple cameras i assume you're working on a on a stage on a set but like how do you hide the cameras from each other how do you choose all the angles like in the pigeon tunnel where did where did you come up with the specific angles you were using okay so um the, uh, it's not stage it's it's a location oh, so really? the, uh, the first interview was done in a 
Yeah, first interview was done in a library. Um, it's tricky. It's tricky. You have four, four cameras. You have uh, up to 12 mirrors in the space. And then you have to shoot. Usually we shoot for like an hour, hour and a half, and then we change angles. And so, so you, you, as a day, in a day, you can get up to like six setups with four cameras with all with mirrors. So it's, it's, uh, it's oh my a game. God. I mean, that sounds like a nightmare be because you, cause you can't, like, you don't want to see the other cameras in the mirror. You know, oh God, that sounds like you're Nordic making lights. Yeah. 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 We do a technique where, uh, 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 like, uh, where we sometimes have cameras within the shot. So, uh, like, uh, because there are a lot, of, a lot of cameras, we uh, erase them. But the tricky part is, if the light changes, you can't do that, you know. So it's, um, uh, but uh, oftentimes, like, there was one shot in uh, in the interview uh, in um, in the blue part of the interview, down, which was downstairs in the basement, where we had three cameras on top of David. They were like just like barely touching him and the fourth one was shoot, shooting a wide shot and then we raised all three cameras but like it was funny to see the the shot with um you know him talking it's like just cameras all over him uh you know but obviously he cannot he cannot cross the the camera with you know, hands or movement so we have to be careful of that, with that but um yeah we raised a lot of cameras uh later on I've actually interviewed him once before, but like I, I always heard that like his technique is like they'll just finish talking and then he won't ask a follow up and then they'll just start talking again eventually. Is that pretty common? Correct. Yes, correct. He doesn't talk much. He's a good listener and it's a conversation. It's always a conversation. It's not an interview. So he doesn't have prepared questions. He does the research and everything, but then it's a conversation and no one knows where the conversation is going to go. That's that's so cool. I, I mentioned a second ago, I had interviewed Errol Morris. It was the first interview I ever did as a journalist ever in my entire life. And it was for the fog of war. And I had so many questions uh -huh. for him. I had a legal pad with like 25 questions and I had like half an hour to talk to him. And I went in and I turned on my recorder and he just started talking. And I don't think I asked one of my questions. So uh, <laughs> like he just, we just had a conversation and uh, it was, it was really yeah. uh, uh, fascinating. Like, you know, I mean, he's just, you know, I, I, it, it was in incredibly terrifying for me because like, here's some Someone whose interviews I found to be like the some of the best ever done, and you know, interviewing him was extremely uh, intimidating. But but he, like you said, he just kind of took that mm -hmm. right right off, even being interviewed himself, and just made it a conversation. He was uh, he was brilliant in that movie. You know, that movie won the Oscar, totally. obviously. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more about the Pigeon Tunnel. Can you just give me a sense of uh, like the schedule? You know, you said that you interviewed him for four days. What's the overall schedule? So I assume that you you do the interview, then Errol Morris goes into the, the edit for however long he goes into the edit for, and then you come back and do the reenactments and the B-roll and anything that you didn't already have. What is the schedule for all that stuff? I mean, usually the enactments are done in like, on a 10 day shoot uh, -huh. uh we shot it in uh, we shot it in hungary uh, oh really um i think it was yeah i think it was 10 or 11 days and uh, we we needed to recreate uh, uh, lebanon we needed to recreate england and we need to recreate different scenes from um, david's past so hungary provided us with uh, those locations and uh, we just went there and shot it there yeah Interesting. So, so that's crazy to think that like this whole movie is basically shot in fourteen days. Is that accurate? No, let me just think uh, if there's anything else. No, that's it. Yeah, that's incredible. I don't know. Like, I, I, I feel like Errol Morris movies to me feel like they, you know, rise from the earth, fully formed, and you know, I can't imagine. You know, I assume that they were shot for years, but you know, it's it's crazy to think that they that they were done so uh, so quickly and efficiently. I mean, it makes sense, I guess, if you break it down and think about you know the the kinds of stuff you're doing, but still, it's so uh, so amazing. Yeah, I mean, we we work incredibly fast. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, no more than uh, three takes. Two takes is uh, usually what what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we we gather like a lot of material, a lot of material because uh, and everything gets used. Like almost every shot we we, we shot in Hungary was used in, in this film. Uh, but usually films are done from the beginning, from the first interview to to the final edit, like in a year. That's cool. And there's a, a movie in your filmography that I feel like people don't talk about enough that is something that I really had a big impact on me and I loved it. And it was from 2011. It's called The Silent House or excuse me, it's called Silent House. And it's yeah. one of those movies that was made in in what appears to be one continuous shot. 
uh, you know, one one stitch together shot. And I, if I'm not mistaken, you guys shot that on like an early DSLR, like a 5D Mark II or something like that. Correct. Um, yes. it, I, I, I saw that movie in the theater and, uh, you know, was completely blown away. When movies like 1917 come out, I'm like, you know, obviously you could go back to Hitchcock's Rope. It's an idea that, that's been done several times, but I feel like The Silent House is an interesting case study of it because not only is it a really just a solid horror movie, it's the first one that I think used the size of the small size of a camera plus, you know, whatever visual effects, but not like crazy complicated, but like after effects and compositing to kind of stitch things together in a way that is really hard to see when you're when you're moving from one shot to the next. Can you talk a little bit about working on on that project? It was interesting uh, challenge, I think, uh, because uh, uh, we sh- uh, shot it in fifteen shots. So it's uh, I believe ninety three, uh, ninety four minutes. It was fifteen shots. Uh, we, we were limited basically just by the uh, by the size of um, card that we could record them. You know, because that, there was no, we, we would shoot probably longer, right, if we had, uh, longer shots if we had it. But it was it was beautiful because we had, I believe, two weeks of rehearsals, everything with actors. Uh, so we would just rehearse all these shots. And we had like some like really challenging things where the operating had to be like, you know, change, going from a crane to handheld into the, from exterior into the house. And uh, uh, we needed to come up with like uh, interesting technical solutions to make it work. But it's 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 a fun project to do because it's um, it allows you to play and to improve it every every take when we rehearse it you know we would add things and and uh, it was almost like a, a little bit like a theater play uh, but with the camera and it's it's a dance it was really a dance with actors and and myself operating it's, which was it was really a beautiful experience yeah excellent excellent well we only have a couple more minutes. So I would love to have you back on the show at some point and kind of talk about your whole, your education, what got you into cinematography. But uh, in the meantime, for our uh, listeners, and I guess our viewers, because we're now posting these on YouTube, where can people find you online if they want to like see your work, interact with your work? Obviously, I would say first go to Apple TV and check out The Pigeon Tunnel. But, uh, but do, you, do you have like a, I mean, web, a website my, or social media? I have Instagram? a website, but I'm not, I'm not big on social media. I, I, don't, I don't have an Instagram account. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not active. <laughs> I I feel like that uh, the work uh, if it does anything if it's uh, you know if it's gonna it's gonna speak for itself I don't know if I need to uh, amp it up you know I mean if if you if you're not on social media you have like four more hours in your day than most of us so uh, so congrats on that anyway well uh, congrats on the pigeon tunnel I hope everyone listening to this uh, checks it out I I thought it was really wonderful like I said I watched it twice I love. Errol Morris's work. I love your work with Errol Morris. So uh, thank you for for giving us some time. Thank you for having me. And I I think uh, I have to say that, uh, uh, you know, your podcast is great. And uh, uh, more podcasts like this just like allow people to like learn about the the craft and see how I learn a lot, obviously, by listening to to other cinematographers as well, because uh, it's all about sharing, sharing ideas, sharing thoughts. And uh, I think you're doing a great job. All right, so that was Igor Martinovich. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Igor. Uh, he's got, uh, he, he wasn't really able to get into too many details, but he has literally another Errol Morris movie that he's currently grading and a third one that they're about to shoot in like March. So they're well, just. Well, it sounds like it only takes him two weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, no, yeah, I, I, that's, I know. That's I'm making it. I'm making a joke because, you know, documentaries take forever. It just so happens that this portion of it was was short. So, By the way, I I don't mean to get into what I just talked about in the interview, but when I was going through his filmography and we were mostly talking about Pigeon Tunnel, so I wasn't talking about his whole filmography, but he's made so many cool movies. Uh, He made a movie that I don't think is gets enough respect. It was in like 2011 and it's called The Silent House. Hmm. And it was one of those movies that was all one apparent unbroken shot, you know, sort of like 1917. And it stars Elizabeth Olsen. And it was done on a, on a 5D Mark II. You know, in addition to checking out Pigeon Tunnel, I, I can't recommend Silent House enough if you get a chance to uh, check it out. And now, short ends. Ilya, it is now time for our short ends, our pet obsession of the week. What is your obsession this week, sir? Well... I don't usually bring it up on the show, but I have definitely a soft spot, a guilty pleasure for competition reality shows, especially ones like The Amazing Race. And it's not just because 
way, way in my past, I helped, you know, support Amazing Race and supplied gear to Amazing Race when I worked at a, at a rental company. I, I legitimately like that show. I watched most of the seasons of it. And I've kind of been looking for another show to kind of pick up the pick up the torch that has been left behind since it's gone off the air. Since COVID, there hasn't, you know, they, they got through half a season and it came back. Well, Amazon has plunked down some money. I think specifically Amazon UK. And they did something rather interesting. I don't know if they partnered with the Broccoli's, but it seems that they have a James Bond themed hmm. amazing race type show called 007 Road to a Million. Hmm. And of all people, they got Brian Cox, like straight out of succession to come play 007 like, himself. Oh, wait. No, no, no. It was to play like a heavy, to play a bad guy, to oh. play sort of like a Spectre. Blofeld as, himself. Yeah, so, no, something like that. Either. No, well, no, but I mean, it, odd job. No, I mean, that's a here. Hannibal Brian, Lecter <laughs> himself. That time Hannibal right. Lecter. Yes, that, that time you'd be correct. And they've got a trailer. They've just dropped it. It's going to be on Amazon. It's a series. And uh, it looks to me like they're taking contestants. They're plunging him to sort of this James Bond-esque world. And they're asking him to do all sorts of fear factor, sort of dangerous types Mm. of things. Fear factor, also my client way back in the day. And I got to say, I was was very into fear factor for a while, too. So we have you to thank for Joe Rogan. Is that what you're telling me? No, no, I'm not responsible. You personally. No, uh, but I got to say that I, I do really appreciate uh, all the effort and all the work that went mm. into making those stunts uh, safe for people, but giving them the impression that they were in real mortal peril all the time. So it looks like the 007 Road to a Million is doing something similar. They're putting these contestants in really like stressful situations and uh, they're making them climb cranes. If you just watch the trailer, it's it's only like a minute or so. You'll see people ice climbing and doing all this stuff and they hid clues all over the earth and they have to get to these different places in order to unlock the mystery to Hmm. win a million pounds. If it's a hit, I can't imagine why they wouldn't do this again. And they've got, you know, the the famous James Bond theme playing like throughout the background. I have to imagine that there's going to be some people who tune in for sort of like the James Bond aspects, some others who like the competition reality shows sort of stuff. And I mean, frankly, uh, I, I might be just tuning in for Brian Cox because he's so freaking awesome. He was he great in succession. Awesome. And the fact that they, they Brian kind of, Cox is great in everything. Yeah, I've, they, I've never not liked him in a thing. If he reads the phone book and he starts going, you know, Adams, Abraham, if he starts going through like, yeah, I, I'd, I'd watch that for an hour. So like, look, I have to imagine that this is going to be amazing. Uh, it certainly has a nice buildup. They certainly put together a good trailer. Uh, we'll put a link to it in the show notes over at Cam Noir. But 007 Road to a Million uh, premieres this week uh, or actually next week. It, it premieres, I think, November 9th or 10th. Hmm. So depending on where you are, November 9th or 10th, uh, you can watch. Uh, I, I don't know if it's season one or episode one, if they're dropping it all at once. But uh, but yeah, it, it'll be it'll be up there and you can let us know what you think. That's awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, Ben, what is your short end this week? Well, I got to say, uh, I, I, I love this time of year, obviously, because big horror movie fan and the movie theaters, I think. In effort, I, I haven't heard, a, I haven't read a story about this, but it seems like a lot of stuff that ordinarily wouldn't be getting theatrical play has been getting theatrical play. So, like, uh, one of the theaters up the street for me was showing like all the classic Universal horror movies, Frankenstein and the Wolfman and Dracula and whatnot. And the theater around the corner for me uh, had a screening of Day of, or has right now. You could go there uh, literally right now and see Day of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead. Excuse me, the George Romero nineteen seventy eight zombie flick dawn of the dead the direct sequel basically to night of the living dead and uh i had not seen it i hadn't seen it in a while and i'd never seen it on the big screen uh i I, like i think i own it on blu-ray or dvd or something and it's one of those comfort food movies that i'm i'm happy that i have it somewhere uh but i hadn't i hadn't sat down and watched it and i'd never seen it on the big screen and i feel like George Romero, uh, I, I love George Romero's work, but for some reason, he, I mean, he only made a handful of like studio projects. His stuff was all independent. And this movie is like one of the most influential movies of the last 50 years. I mean, all you have to do is watch literally any episode of The Walking Dead to see it liberally ripped off. But I, had, I hadn't like sat down to, to, to watch it on the big screen and I was kind of blown away. It's interesting to me sometimes when you go see a movie like I remember seeing Citizen Kane or uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey on the big screen for the first time after having seen them on 
home video my whole life. You know, like you notice subtleties, but also like it holds your attention in a different way. And there's something also just as I know, I constantly harp on about the the group experience. So my my friend Greg Erb, who's a, a screenwriter, invited me to go see it, and I was like, oh man, it's starting at 10:50. I don't even know if I can, because I know it's long. It's over two hours long. I'm like, am I going to even be awake when this thing is over? And it, it was just like one of the most uh, immersive, grab your attention kind of movies. The performances, I think, are are really good. You know, like Ken Foray especially is just phenomenal in the movie. It looks great. It was the same DP who shot a bunch of George Romero movies and then stopped shooting entirely. It looks really good. It's the movie that's all set in a, in a, in a shopping mall. There was a remake. Zack Snyder did a remake of it in 2003 or 2004, I guess, that really the only similarity was it was zombies in a shopping mall. In a mall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this is like, it's a weird snapshot into what a mall was like in the 1970s what culture was like in the 1970s. Tom Savini's uh, gore makeup was, you know, just second to none. Nobody was doing what Tom Savini did back then. And uh, to me, it's like uh, when I watch an older movie, the question is always, does it hold up? It's hard for a movie that's like so much of a product of its time to hold up and be immortal. And also hard for a movie that was relatively low budget for its time to compete, you know, you, you kind of go, this movie came out the year after Star Wars, you know, like it's hard to compete in that world. And yet there's something so um, immediate about it. And so much of that movie is kind of a hangout movie. It's like, what if the apocalypse happened and you were, you and your buddies were just hunkered down in a mall and could do whatever you wanted. And you just had to like keep this little problem of a zombie apocalypse a little bit at bay while you did it. And it kind of shows how they do it. And uh, I don't know. I, I think it's a wonderful film. And it's probably going to be playing. I saw it at a Regal Theater. It's probably going to be playing in Regal Theaters for the next week after Halloween. So if you're hearing the sound of my voice and you can get to a Regal Theater, see if Dawn of the Dead is playing and uh, check it out. It's, it's really worth it. You probably know this already, but do you know the name of that mall? That they re- that they shot at. I I don't off the top of my head know the name of the mall, and I've heard it a hundred times. I, it's but yeah, the Monroeville it's, yeah. Mall, and the Monroeville Mall actually does a Living Dead weekend, and the next one's going to be June seventh through 9th, twenty twenty four, and they have one of the largest zombie walks in the world where people get dressed up, and there's this whole like thing that goes on. So I I've heard that they try to set a record every year for the n- number huh. of people that show up. Well, so and, I, and of, I knew like, that mall was still in operation, like it's still a mall. Uh, um, it is, and it's uh, I believe in Pennsylvania. So yeah, uh, well yeah, Pittsburgh. And- I mean that's where uh, that's where Romero is from, and Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead were made there. He started mixing it up with Day of the Dead, which I think was shot partly in Florida and partly in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the fact that they have so many people show up and do that, I, I'm really tempted that we should fly out there in the summer and go go check it out. Would you Would you like to go? Ben? Yes. Okay, let, let, we'll see if we can make that happen. <laughs> I think that would be I think that'd be totally worth doing for the podcast to cover the Living Dead weekend at the Mar- Monroeville Mall. Oh my God. Yes. A, a right. thousand times yes. <laughs> All right. So next June, so June 7th through 9th, we'll, I'll put it on the calendar. We'll see if we can make it happen. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I want to do is, and it's uh, this is a little log rolly on my part, but there's a guy in Maryland named Matt Blasey who does the Blair Witch Experience every October. And a weekend in October, he takes people out and brings them to all the locations where we shot Blair Witch. Like all nice. of them. He found all of them. Every That's single great. one. <laughs> And, uh, and and does kind of a guided tour. And Ed Sanchez, the co-director of Blair, which still lives in Maryland, so he usually goes. And I reached out to all the other principals on it to see if they would come out this year. So And they all kind of said yes. So we'll see, because oh. I'd like to go. I've, I've been meaning to go. And this year will be the 25th anniversary of us. Sh- of a, it's the 25th anniversary of the movie's release, actually. Wow. Okay. Because uh, I believe last year was 90. the 25th anniversary of us shooting it. 93, was it? What year was that? 94? Oh, we, sh- we shot it in 97. 97, okay, gotcha. We shot it in 97 and it came out in 99. It's set in 1994, which is maybe why you're saying 93. I, mean, I think that's why, exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, it's we, right. It would have been much later because I saw it in LA. Yeah. So 90, we were, I thought I saw it in 98. We, but I guess it was we were very right. excited about making a period piece. So we were making a movie <laughs> set in 1994, but we were shooting it in 1997. Nice. You you were going back three years. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So, Ben, uh, I think that's just about going to do it for this episode. Uh, Where can people find you? They want to find you. Uh, If you want to find me, you can find me at benrock.com. 
which uh, go back a year or so and you'll hear the whole story about how I got that URL. But benrock.com, you can find all my social media links. You can check out my reel, blah, blah, blah. You can find links to most of my work, uh, the work that I feel like showing you anyway. And uh, that's it. Ilya, how about yourself? Where can people find you? You can find me at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. Located in beautiful Burbank, California, you can. It is beautiful. Yeah, hit us up. In fact, it'll be beautiful in December. It's you know it'll be a hundred degrees, unlike you know uh, thirty nine degrees where it is right now in Portland, Oregon. So. Mm. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, hit me up at, at Hot Ride Cameras. You can reach out to me there. Otherwise, uh, also LinkedIn seems to be a place that people are reaching out to me, and I've done a pretty good job of blocking all the spam that was coming through LinkedIn. Oh so, man, the LinkedIn yeah. spam is the worst. You know, it's whenever, pretty whenever spam, someone friends, yeah. uh, follows you or connects to you on LinkedIn and you get a message from them that just says, hi, that's all it says, I've just delete them that. right then. Just don't, okay. don't end that conversation right away. It's <laughs> Nip it in it, the bud. It's not going anywhere. Cause like someone who's like really there to pitch you a business related thing, maybe is going to have kind of a cheesy pre-built like business pitch or mm-hmm. If they're an actual human being who's not just like spamming everybody who who says that they'll be friends, they'll say like, hey, I noticed that you're into blah, blah, blah. Let's can we talk about blah, blah, blah. But but if somebody just says hi, it's a scam. Mm, Thank you. I I appreciate that. Yeah, I I I know whenever I pick up a phone call now that I don't recognize the number and I hear a blip. There's like a noise that happens at the beginning. Oh, my God. One of those is a a spam. The the spam spam calls are awful. I keep getting anyway. All right, so, so, so Ben, <laughs> let's thank some people. Who do we have to thank this week? Well, let's thank, uh, first and foremost, Alana Cody, uh, kicking all the ass, getting us a bunch of interviews. We have some really awesome ones coming up. Uh, we should thank Ben Katz, who is, uh, even now, because I'm saying this as he's editing this, uh, he's making us not sound like complete imbeciles. So thank, thank you, Ben. Thank, uh, thanks, Ben. Yeah, ben, thanks. ben. Ben's an awesome editor, and uh, everyone should hire him to edit whatever it is needs editing. And uh, lastly, but never leastly, we should thank Kay's Alatrachi, who will probably call me up with a criticism of something I said on this podcast today and say, you were wrong about blah, 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 because he does that a lot. And uh, I don't I don't mean to make him sound like a villain. Kay's just <laughs> like, he, he likes listening to the podcast and he, and he engages me in conversations about it. Check out Kay's website, musicbykays.com. For God's sakes, hire him to compose a sco- an original score, a kick-ass original score for your next project. He's awesome. Or... You could hire him to direct it, or you could hire him to do the CGI for it, or you could hire him to color grade your project. You could hire him for all of those things, but you'd also have to pay him four salaries. So, so don't just hire him for <laughs> don't just hire him for one. Yeah, and expect yeah, that you're gonna get gonna get. No, all no, you of don't. That, you don't get yeah. four for the price of one ever. But he can do all those jobs. He's really that great. Yeah, and I didn't even talk about sound design because you know what? He doesn't especially he doesn't, love. Does, he, he doesn't, doesn't love, love doing sound design, but he's great at it. And, and he'll compose music. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's that's his first love. Anyway, uh, that about wraps us up. You want to take us out, Ilya? Thanks for listening. Or watching. Or watching and listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.